Okay, I think it's working now. They turned it on. Okay, uh, so I'm going to give a very brief introduction. Uh, my name is David Benjamin. Uh, I teach here at the School of Architecture, and I'm also the director of the Living Architecture Lab here. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to be uh, kind of co-presenting uh, this talk today uh, with mechanical engineering and computer science in a, in a partnership that I hope uh, will will continue with, with other inspiring lectures like this today. Um, if you're here in this room, uh, you've probably already uh, seen Hod's TED Talk uh, or read some of his 200 plus uh, technical papers published in the top journals such as Nature and Science, or maybe you've watched uh, some of his amazing and often viral project videos of things like evolving robots and self-repairing robots. Um, or maybe you heard him interviewed on National Public Radio or read his quotes in the New York Times just this last weekend or other papers like Wall Street Journal or magazines like Newsweek or Time. Um, so you probably also already know that he directs the Creative Machines Lab at Cornell University, uh, which pioneers new ways uh, to make machines that create and also machines that are creative. Um, from my perspective, Hod is a, a pioneer and an innovator in a kind of embarrassing amount of topics uh, from robotics to evolutionary computing uh, to new materials to digital simulation to artificial intelligence to data science and of course to 3D printing which is the, the topic of the talk uh, this afternoon. So uh, although Hod is not an architect, I think that he's actually um, an ideal model researcher and thinker and designer for an experimental architecture school like ours here. And it's a great honor for the School of Architecture and for me personally to have Hod Lipson here today. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, pleasure to speak here. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I'll uh, try to live up to all of that. And uh, I don't know which microphone to use. Yeah, okay. I can sing and dance with this. All right. So, uh, so what I wanted to talk about today is uh, 3D printing. And I used to give talks about 3D printing uh, for quite a while on different aspects, but increasingly more and more people know about it and know what it is. And so I've switched to talking about the future of 3D printing. Just to give it a different edge. And what I wanted to share with you today is a little bit of some of my thoughts of where things are going, because everybody is familiar with where it is now. What are some of the biggest challenges lying ahead? And I'll try to interweave into that some of the projects that we're doing at Cornell, some projects that other people are doing, just to give you an idea. So I'm sure you're all familiar with 3D printers by now, certainly if you're here in the audience. Machines that build up objects layer by layer by stacking material layer upon layer to build something that th that's three dimensions. We've seen lots of them around. Increasingly, uh, you know, back uh, 10 years ago when I used to talk about this, most people haven't, uh, you know, wasn't aware of it or how it worked, but now most people have seen it. But most people still uh, are not really familiar with a couple of different points. Most people have seen sort of plastic extrusion uh, type printers that make uh, objects in sort of by melting and extruding uh, plastic material, uh, FDM processes like MakerBot and so forth. But uh, there's a lot, this technology has been around for a long time. This is a piece that I have. Uh, it's printed in nylon. It's about 15 years old. And uh, I would challenge anybody to, to look close at that and actually see even with the naked eye, be able to see the, the, the layers. It's so, so, uh, it's, it's so well made, it's high resolution, it's about 15 years old. Uh, also, many people aren't really familiar with the fact that you can print in metal. This is a metal piece. It's printed in, uh, uh, this one is printed in uh, stainless steel. It's solid stainless steel. Uh, it's as good as uh, bulk stainless steel. And what you see here is the sort of finish that it comes out 
of the printer. So it's pretty pretty good. It has a, this particular part is a part is an impeller of an engine. It's very uh, complex in its shape. Would be a nightmare to fabricate any other way, especially the holes that go into the top and they're curved, which allows for sort of better cooling performance of this part. So it's really a fascinating thing. This particular part is produced by laser sintering, so a laser that moves around and welds or fuses together powder, uh, metal powder, uh, then shakes and spreads another layer of powder, fuses that with the laser, and gradually builds it up. So, so that's sort of what uh, is in existence today. So let's talk about the future. Where do we want this technology to go, and where is it actually going? So here's an example. So this is probably the best example of where we want it, what we want it to be. We want to have a machine that makes anything, uh, anything that you can imagine. Uh, but really, technology started a long time ago. This is a, one of the first pictures of a 3D printed uh, object uh, printed back in 83. That, that's uh, 30 years ago. Uh, it, to me, it's pretty amazing the, uh, the quality of the print. Actually, it's also interesting to see that the quality of photography has improved quite a bit since uh, 83. But, but besides that, the print itself is pretty, pretty high resolution on par with many of the prints that we have today. So technology is in existence a long time, and yet something happened in the last couple of years that made it sort of shoot up in awareness in an unprecedented way. Most of my career is along this flat area here where nothing was going on, it's all the way up here. But something in the last two, three years happened that allowed everybody to, to become aware of this. So what has happened? Is anything fundamental change? I think two things have happened that uh, in the last two, three years have sort of made this technology shoot up in awareness. One of them is that machines entered the consumer scale. So up until a couple of years ago, the, the cheapest machine you could get was maybe $15,000, not a consumer scale machine. But uh, around the mid-2000s, two open source uh, systems were released. Uh, the RepRap in the UK, the Fab at Home in the US. That was actually uh, done at Cornell. And a lot of people started building these machines at home. So it broke the barrier. Uh, a lot of machines sort of are descendants of these. The MakerBot actually borrowed a lot of design elements from both of these. And that sort of allowed suddenly the, to, to sort of break the $1,000 barrier. And while the consumer scale machines are still a very, very small portion of the market in terms of finance, they are definitely the majority of where the awareness of this technology is coming from. So this is one thing that happened and sort of talk, took off around 2008, 2009. Second thing is the range of materials. And up until recently, rapid uh, 3D printing is more, is better known as rapid prototyping, a technology for making prototypes. And while it has been uh, used for a long time, it was used mainly for making prototypes that will later produce using mass production. So if you look around you, everything in your office, in your car, at home was probably prototype using this technology at some point, but then produced uh, in mass. But increasingly, new materials are arriving that allow us to produce with this technology, produce end products. This means that we can take advantage of this, these materials to actually take advantage of the complexity and the design space afforded by these machines for the end product. And so you can now print in metals. This is a, a printed uh, heel and titanium. You just couldn't make something like that any other way. It's just completely uh, impossible, certainly not on any um, uh, an unconventional manufacturing system. And so if you're limited to things that can all be mass produced, you'd never come up with this kind of design. But you can now print in clay. You can print in wood-like material. Uh, you can print in glass. You can even pr print in concrete, uh, large-scale things. This is a recent example I've shown of a new machine that prints in paper. Uh, this is uh, actually made out of layers of paper stacked on each, onto each other. You then sort of peel off the paper and you have the part. It's a technology that actually was invented back in the early 90s, never made it commercially, but now is getting a comeback in a much better performance. Uh, this banana and grapefruit are actually printed in paper. They uh, look like the real thing. They, they don't taste like the real thing, but they're, they're, they're pretty amazing uh, to see. Uh, you can print in sand. You can print in terracotta. This is an example of somebody who's printed a boat out of recycled milk jugs. 
so it's 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 uh, and try to win the the milk the milk jug uh, regatta in University of Washington, but it was disqualified because that's not what they meant when they said build a boat out of milk jugs. Uh, somebody else uh, built uh, printed uh, again, uh, out of uh, rice flour. So really a huge range of materials, anywhere from cheese to stainless steel. Basically, a whole, all materials known to man. And uh, there's, it's, it's uh, fascinating also, also to see prints at all scales. This is uh, printing in uh, stone-like material, the architectural scale, and also printing at micro scale, uh, where this whole device is about a micron in size and, uh, and uh, sorry, millimeter in size and micron uh, layers. So my interest in uh, 3D printing actually came from a project I did a while ago, which I talked about in the other talk today, uh, which involved evolving robots. Uh, and we, the, what we did there is we used a lot of robots in simulation to compete with each other. The better ones got to reproduce, making new robots with slight variations. And we let that thing sort of brew in simulation for thousands of generations. And the best robots got to step into reality using a 3D printer. This is back in uh, 99. This uh, robot sort of stepped into reality at, uh, in 2000, made it to the front page of New York Times. It was robots making robots at the time. And, but, uh, and so this is sort of my first encounter with this technology. And at this point, uh, my research sort of focus split into looking at how to evolve better robots but also trying to print a robot, including the wires. We really wanted to have a robot walk out of the printer, batteries included. So since then, we've been uh, printing a lot of robots in different uh, sizes uh, and shapes. Once you have a 3D printer that's high resolution, it's, it's very addictive. Let me put it this way. We, if we need a, a tube, we will sketch it out on a computer and print it rather than walk down the hall to the stock room to see if there's a tube of the right, uh, right size. And we've been printing all kinds of robots, shapes and sizes. This is a flapping, hovering robot that weighs about three grams, excluding the motor and the battery. And it flaps its wings and hovers in place. And it's stable. It's like a mosquito. You can punch it, and it sort of rights itself. And it can hover for about 90 seconds. And for a couple of months, it was the world. It, hold it, it held the, the, the world record in flapping, hovering. Uh, flight. So one of the things that's uh, striking about this technology is that it really enters each and every field. I think if, uh, uh, you know, if there's one message for you to take home is that whatever you're doing, this technology will affect what you're doing. Uh, anywhere uh, from fashion to uh, art and music, this is one of the, the uh, extraordinary examples that I've seen recently of an artist that, uh, this is a an installation uh, done at the time of the oil uh, spill in the Gulf, and he calls this, I think, oil fall. It's a waterfall out of oil simulated in a computer, then frozen in time and 3D printed. So you can get this uh, oil fall, you can print it, and you can have an oil fall in your living room if that's what you want, install it uh, anywhere. And it's a good sort of example of new kinds of arts enabled by this uh, technology. Uh, we have an uh, archaeology department at Cornell that now uses this almost regularly when they go on digs, they find something, they scan it, chip it electronically. It's much more complicated uh, to take things out of digs, but they can chip it. On the left, you can see an, a 3,000 years uh, cuneiform. On the right, you see the replica. And to the non-expert eye, it looks, feels, the same, it weighs the same, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic example. The other area that uh, technology is already making a big change is uh, education. And there's, I think, fundamentally two different ways that technology is affecting education. And the first one is sort of the obvious one, and that is the ability to create and duplicate teaching models. These are mechanical instruments we have at Cornell from the, 19, from the 1860s, which uh, were used to teach mechanics. And for a long time, uh, all we could do is post videos and pictures of these online with descriptions. But now, we also have files that you can download and print replicas, working replicas of all these instruments. So people across the planet are downloading and using these instruments to teach mechanics in a way that was, really, was never really possible uh, before in any sort of 
uh, viable way. You'll never get sort of a commercial company to start manufacturing these. But the deeper way that education is changing is sort of the empowerment uh, that these printers offer. This is an example of a summer school uh, that we did uh, a year ago for high school kids who came for a week to do a sort of uh, project at Cornell. These high school kids, they were probably uh, there reluctantly, sent by their parents to do a week. They came, and uh, instead of just teaching them about engineering and how great it is, we did this project which we called uh, uh, Design Make Sell. And the idea is from going from concept to selling a product online, making a profit, in one week. And uh, quite a few kids started designing and this idea that you can actually have somebody that doesn't know you personally buy a product they design is an incredible uh, empowering feeling that some of these students uh, managed to get. This student over here designed a uh, sort of a pencil holder that's pretty innovative and he was already within one week selling these online, printed in bronze and ceramics and all kinds of things. And uh, it was interesting that with one uh, hand, he uh, uh, was holding a, a jailbroken uh, iPhone. On the other hand, is asking, what if somebody steals my design and sells it? And it's interesting to sort of see this, this bifurcation and thinking about intellectual property that we haven't seen before. So whenever I talk about this, people ask, OK, what's the killer app? What's the big thing that you know, that's really going to get everybody using 3D printers? What is, what is, where's the money in this? And Maybe it's in cell phone casings. It's not, but it sometimes seems like that's where it is because that's what everybody prints uh, with it. But I think there's some other areas. Maybe the, the best example of how this technology is opening up new business models is uh, work uh, is in the medical industry. This is an example of uh, Invisalign braces, uh, braces that are printed in plastic. They're sort of unique to every person that uses them. There's a series of them that gradually align the teeth. And what's interesting about this is that there are 50,000 of these printed each day. Now, I triple check that number. It's not 50,000 a year. 50,000 a day of these printed. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands. It's likely that somebody in this room is wearing these, probably not aware of the fact that they're actually 3D printed. But this technology is only possible because of 3D printing, because it cannot be mass produced. It has to be custom made for every person, the very complex geometry, and so forth. So an example of a new business model that wouldn't be even viable using any other manufacturing technology. It's also used to make hearing cases and, uh, and uh, uh, crowns and lots of other things. And it's not just for people. This is a 3D printed uh, uh, prosthetic beak for a bird. It lost uh, its uh, beak uh, in uh, accident. You can see it's very mad. Uh, and uh, left there, and then it has its beak restored, and it's, it's happy. A lot of work also in bioprinting, which I think is sort of taking the, this whole idea of printing uh, for medicine to a new step where you actually print with live cells. So not just plastic, not printing scaffold, but actually taking live cells and printing them into a 3D shape. This is work we did on uh, taking live cells from cartilage, uh, from meniscus, cartilage of the knee, using culturing those cells, putting them in hydrogel, and reprinting the meniscus in the shape from a CT scan. So you sort of have a replacement meniscus that you need to culture and beat up in a bioreactor until you can get it to actually perform like a true meniscus. But you can sort of arrange cells in ways that you can sort of never do before. And this is opening the door to doing a lot of interesting things, uh, like printing heart valves. This is work by Jonathan Butcher at Cornell. It's printing heart valves from live cells of different types to get the different gradients of stiffness that are necessary into, in a live cell. So, there's, so I mean, the complexity of tissue start off with bone and cartilage, which are the simplest, going up to kidney and liver, which other people are working on. And ultimately, I think, you know, in the future, you'll have your body sort of scanned when you're young and healthy, and you have all, everything on file. And when you need new parts, you kind of call them up, especially when it's called, uh, when it's, you know, um, orth or orthopedic parts like bone, muscle, and so forth. So maybe that's the killer app. Maybe it's not. Uh, if I have to uh, place my bets, there's one area that I think is really going to grow, and that is printing food. And I know it sounds a bit frivolous, but uh, in terms of, sort of atten people's attention 
And what people do with open source printers beyond the engineering community, this is sort of where things are heading. We've done some experiments here at the French Culinary Institute uh, who used some of our printers to print with celery and scallop all kinds of shapes and, of course, fry them just to give that the last uh, the touch. And so where else can you get a scallop gear wheel you know, that, uh, that uh, you can't get any other way? This is, uh, uh, this is uh, interesting. This is a cookie that uh, looks uh, squarish, rectangular. When you cut it in half, it has C inside. Um, and so uh, it's uh, sort of uh, maybe a new way to send passwords, but it's also a, uh, <coughs> a um, interesting way of sort of a, a, a new com connection between cooking and, in and um, information technology that up to now sort of remained uh, separate. Now, uh, in case you think it's completely frivolous, there's also some interesting medical applications of this. This is a cookie printer that sort of c controls the level of sugar based on your activity the previous day. So you wake up in the morning and you get the thing that you uh, earned, not the thing that you want. So this is, uh, this is an example. And I, you can see how combining this with biometric, uh, combining this <coughs> excuse me, with um, uh, various uh, information, med medical information, allergies, and so forth, you can start doing a lot of interesting things. Uh, marker threads are really interesting, difficult to predict, but just to put things in context, when you look at 3D printing, if this is an entire 3D manufacturing going on in the world, this is um, two plus, um, two to three trillion dollar manufacturing uh, in the US, this is 3D printing. In case you can't see it, it's right there. It's very, very small. It's about two to three billion dollars, very, very small, but is growing very, very rapidly at around 25% a year. So technology is gradually infiltrating lots and lots of different areas. Uh, the, the, the medical and dental, as I mentioned, is big. A lot of consumer electronics design is still, are still using this mostly for prototyping, but increasingly for other things. But uh, interestingly, the, I think the biggest trend to watch is this direct part production, as I said not just uh, prototyping, but actually making things that, that in 3D printing that are actually sold after they are printed, and that's sort of the, the big area where there's a lot of growth. But it's important to realize, uh, as the, the new, uh, as uh, the president of uh, MakerBot recently said, that 3D printing is really an ecosystem of a lot of different industries that are coming together, printer manufacturers, material suppliers, and developers, there's a lot of work there, Design software tools are developing. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, service providers are popping left and right. The biggest one is here in, Sh in Shapeways. Uh, and a lot of new designers and users that are beginning to use the technology in new ways that are not, were not uh, possible before. So when you look at these numbers that I just showed about how things are growing, it's really difficult to draw this number around the bigger picture of what our designers doing with that, what kind of new business opportunities are created. So, uh, you know, we before I go into sort of talking about where things are going in the future, I wanted to share with you some uh, key principles uh, that uh, sort of underlie a lot of this technology. I recently co-authored a book on 3D printing. We interviewed uh, a lot of people uh, with uh, Melba Kerman. And uh, we found that a lot of the people who use 3D printing, either in industry and academia uh, and business, all sort of came to it from the same basic fundamental angles. It was always one of these things that sort of underlied uh, what, uh, why they were using 3D printers. So I wanted to quickly share those with you because I think it's a good way to understand how this technology is different and why it's here to stay. So, let me quickly go through this. The, the principle number one that is unique about this technology and is groundbreaking is that manufacturing complexity is free. So what does that mean? It means that making something complex as this part on the left doesn't take any more time, skill, or cost than printing a paperweight of the same size with no complexity. So in other words, the complexity of the shape doesn't matter. It's only the amount of material. And that is a profound difference from most of human history. We're making more complex things usually required more time, skill, energy, uh, labor, and so forth. So this is a profound difference. If you can take advantage of this idea, you can sort of build something that was not possible 
before. Second principle is that variety is free. So the same machine can make a huge variety of things, sometimes in the same build process. So again, most manufacturing processes are sort of, they can make a variety of things, but in a fairly confined space. And usually if you want to make something different, you go to a different machine. But again, here, the same machine can make a huge variety. This has profound implications to customization, making lots of different things, and so forth. Principle number three that kept coming up from an industrial point of view that there is no, no assembly required or less assembly required. What does that mean? So if you look at industry, most of the cost of things you own and buy and make have to do with assembly. Uh, the assembly labor is where most of the cost is in your iPhone. And it's not, uh, it's not just uh, the cost of the assembly, but it's also the errors come from assembly. This is where humans are often involved. And, uh, and that's where there's a lot of the, the ch design challenges. Whereas if you can print the things that are pre-assembled, you can skip a lot of that. This is, this is an example of uh, a part of an uh, air, air duct, the aircraft. And because it's uh, printed pre-assembled, there's less parts involved, shorter supply chain, and also the part is more efficient, air flows better, it's smoother, there's less chance of it breaking, it's lighter, a lot of good things happen, there's smaller part count, all because there's no assembly required. Principle number four has to do with zero lead time, which means that from the point that you have your design on file to the point you can start producing, there's relatively short time. This is again different than most manufacturing system that have a lot of setup time, a lot of tool changing before you can start production. And this has a profound implications to things like on-demand manufacturing uh, and uh, minimizing stock, uh, digital um, inventories and things like that that require zero lead time. Fifth principle has, I think, my favorite in, in, is zero constraints. So again, the idea here is that compared to other manufacturing techniques, there are much, much fewer design constraints on the shape. This is an example of a printed uh, bench, printed this of marble-like material, has a crazy shape. It would be very difficult to make this as almost any other manufacturing method, but because we produce it with 3D printing, you can make it uh, a lot, you know, can take advantage of this new design space. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you've ever, taken a course on manufacturing or taught it, you'll know that a lot of time is spent understanding the constraints of different manufacturing technologies. This tool can only make round things. This can make, uh, you know, every tool has its, its pros and cons, its strengths and weaknesses. And these constraints are a big part of, the, of design. And that uh, is gradually going away. Sixth principle is this idea that there's no skill involved in manufacturing. Of course, this is an extreme thing. And, uh, a lot of people who operate machines will disagree with me, but in general, I couldn't find a better picture for this. It really takes very little training to operate these machines, and especially to produce things of similar complexity on conventional machines, you would need a lot more training. This has implications to things like using this in schools, uh, in education, and so forth, uh, using it in places without access to training. Uh, I. Uh, that recently visited a uh, company that uses 3D printers to produce uh, aerospace parts, pretty sophisticated parts. And I asked the person, uh, the manager there, you know, what kind of training the people have to operate these machines. And I was hoping he's gonna say, well, we need PhDs and then we thank you for producing. But what he said is, the way he put it uh, was, if they can show up on time, clean and sober, they can operate the machine. And that was, to me, a really interesting uh, perspective. Uh, and again, it has pros and cons on jobs and creation, but also it definitely shows that now the onus is on the designer. Okay, the, the skill is now in the design, not in the manufacturing. And that's, again, a very interesting turn of events. Good job security for designers. There's uh, principle number seven, this idea that the machines are compact. They pack a lot of might into a small footprint. If you've ever seen an injection molding machine, it could be the size of this room even to produce toothbrushes. Now, it does produce toothbrushes at one a second, but it is a very, very big machine. Not the easy to transport, to move around, not easy to own or operate. But these machines are relatively small and portable, and this has, again, profound implications to their accessibility to areas that normally don't have access to manufacturing technology and so forth. 
Eighth is this idea of uh, minimizing waste byproduct by using the additive process. This is sort of a little bit of a controversial issue in plastics. It's not exactly true, but in metals it is very true compared to other methods. Uh, what I'm showing here is an example of a machine I recently saw making turbine blades in titanium, a process that would be very expensive, produce a lot of waste using conventional techniques, but here by adding it, you can come produce it in a much more efficient and much less uh, waste byproduct. Ninth principle has to do with, uh, with uh, multiple materials, uh, and uh, I'll touch on that uh, more, but the ability to combine materials in a new way, much like you, less, much like you, the way you combine different um, inks to create new colors is an interesting possibility and, and we're just beginning to explore what this sort of principle offers. And finally, the precise repeatability of this technology. In other words, you have all information is the design file because there's no skill in all these things. You can produce the same thing in lots of different machines almost without worrying about it. Uh, that is much more difficult to do if you're using conventional manufacturing method, getting everything to come out the same way everywhere you produce it. But this is leading to things like cloud manufacturing where you send your part, it's produced 100 times, one on each, and a set, every one of those 100 parts is produced on a different machine, on a different place, and they all come to you in one way. <clears throat> it's also creating <clears throat> a lot of headaches from intellectual property and law and so forth and what that means that you can just sort of copy things and so forth. So I want to focus a little bit uh, the rest of the time on this uh, bigger question of what's coming up next. And I first have to disclaim that I don't know what's coming up next. I'm going to just speculate and to me it feels a little bit like sitting here in the 1970s trying to predict how computers are going to be used. And at that time uh, everybody could tell you that computers are going to disrupt accounting and they're going to disrupt military calculation. It was a no-brainer to predict sort of the obvious number crunching things, but how nobody in the 70s could predict Facebook and video conferencing and so forth. So the question is, what can we not predict right now? There are certain things we know are going to happen with 3D printing and certain things we don't. And contrary to, to what many people believe, the big companies back in the 70s knew there is a big potential for 3D printers, <coughs> for computers in the whole market, but they couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, this was uh, an ad produced by Honeywell uh, back in the 70s when they released their kitchen computer. So it makes you cringe when you, when you, when you uh, uh, read it, but you know, it included, uh, it, was, it had a recipe lookup, it had its own cutting board over here, and uh, it cost $10,000. And it was a complete flop. This is one of those in the computer museum. But uh, it, predicting how people, you know, sort of disruptive technologies uh, is very difficult. One thing we know for sure is that the machines themselves are going to get better, cheaper, and faster. And we're not even thinking about it deeply. You can be sleeping through all of this talk, and you'll know that, yes, next thing, machines are going to have higher resolution, better materials, stronger materials. They will be cheaper. They will work faster. That's all obvious. Everybody's working on it. There's some sort of slightly deeper things that are going to happen, like uh, feedback. All, all of these machines right now work uh, in open loop. They just print. They don't look at what they're printing. Uh, we've created this printer in the lab that prints in, uh, and actually watches what it's printing. It's recalibrating its material properties as it's printing. It's learning. And so you, you can print with a much broader range of materials because it's actually learning from its prints and correcting, and you can do a lot of bad things to the print while it's printing and it still comes out the same way. There's obviously going to be a lot of work in standards. We've uh, just uh, finished uh, developing and releasing this new ASTM standard now in review in ISO, for, in ISO in Europe for information exchange between printers so they all can talk uh, between themselves and uh, convey materials. But let's, look, let's take a look at the longer term. Where is this technology going in the longer term? And I like to think about it as really as four phases. And we are maybe at the end of the first phase, <clears throat> first episode, if you like, of this technology. So let me go through these four episodes uh, with you. This is the first episode is where we gain complete control over printing any shape and form that we can imagine. So this is where we are now. So any 
shape that you can imagine, that you can describe to a computer, you can make. And that's a new thing, never was possible before. Any shape that you can sort of describe as a geometry in a computational way, you can make. And this is, this is uh, new and, and profound, and this is where we're at now, where complexity of the shape doesn't matter. It's the same whether it's a complex shape or a cube. But this in itself is already creating a, a, a big st stressor on design tools because manufacturing tools now are so advanced. The challenge is how can we design? And in my opinion, design tools aren't keeping pace with manufacturing tools. So now there's a big gap. I see this all the time with students when we talk about in, in our product design course, you know, here's, you have access to 3D printers, you can design, you can make anything you want now design something, and often students have a hard, excuse me, <clears throat> they have a hard time coming up with new ideas, uh, not because they lack imagination, but because they lack design tools to describe it to a computer. <clears throat> so I can imagine in the future you'd have we have to think about design in a different way, and one idea is to sort of talk about think about design as work as compilers that work work through constraints. Imagine you want to design a bracket that holds up a shelf. You go to the, your uh, computer or to your 3D printer. You say, uh, computer, I have this volume to work with. Here's my wall. I need to support a force in this direction. Design it for me. You hit enter. The computer knows what kind of materials are available to you in your printer, and it designs it for you. And here's a computer actually designing in real time a bracket that holds up this particular weight out of a particular material. <clears throat> and it can do that sort of based uh, automatically. So you look at this and you say, well, actually, I want to keep this area open. I need to pass a, a pipe or a cable through it. Uh, let me see what, uh, what uh, designs you can come up that keep this area open. So it redesigns it, but keeps the center open, and you get a different design. So it's a different way of doing design where you, we're not, you don't point and click at everything you want, you don't set in tune parameters, but you work at a much higher level where you're actually providing constraints, providing goals, and the computer, so like an expert designer at your service, uh, design things for you. And in fact, uh, a lot of things are designed uh, this way uh, or you know, for sort of optimal aerospace parts, but we want to expand this technology, uh, make it available to everybody so that you can actually use it in lots of different uh, places. Another example of a sort of idea based on that, this is work we've done recently releasing uh, endless, uh, a website called Endless Forms where you can uh, design things by critiquing. So it turns out that most people are better as critics than uh, as designers. They can't design stuff, but they can say what they like and don't like, which means that you can design something. Let's say you want to design a new perfume bottle you walk up to the computer, it shows you lots of random shapes. They're all 300 milliliters or whatever the constraint is. You look at these random shapes and you say, I like this, I like this, I don't like this, I don't like that. The computer listens to you, takes that information, and generates new shapes based on what you like. And after a while, you get interesting shapes. So now there's about 3 million shapes that are generated on endless forms, including these shapes that, were, that would be pretty difficult to, to create uh, using most CAD systems, but here people are designing these simply by saying what they like and don't like. And I think this is sort of a paradigm shift in design. It's a little bit, if you've ever designed a house, or you will, you'll see that you don't, most people don't, do, well, actually this crowd might uh, uh, do it uh, directly, but for the rest of us, we go up to an architect, and the architect looks at, uh, shows us floor plans, and we say, we like this, we like this, we don't like this, and we don't like that. I like this living room floor plan, I like that kitchen. And an architect will listen and come back with new designs. And this is sort of an iterative process where all the customer is doing is critiquing, but it leads to a design, and that thing can be emulated. It involves being able to, in the back background, model what are the aesthetic senses of the particular user that's using it. So we're now working on an eye tracking system where you don't even have to point and click at what you like. You just sit back, relax, and it's what you look at that gets selected and promoted for the next iteration. And that's a pretty, uh, it's actually a pretty scary thing to do uh, because uh, sometimes you look at things you're not supposed to. 
or you don't like, and uh, and sort of it's it's more of a psycho it's it's a half design half psychology test. But it's uh, interesting to see what comes out. There's also uh, 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 you know people are using it to 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 print all kinds of things uh, and uh, and do all kinds of arts. But this ability to create things also leads to sort of uh, nightmare situation of intellectual property which is sort of looming and the crux of this intellectual property conundrum is that uh, it is easy to copy things for example if you copy a doorknob and duplicate it probably that doorknob is not protected by patents it's not protected by copyright because it's functional and it's not protected by trademark if it doesn't have a trademark on it so is, is it okay to copy it, and it turns out that, uh, according to the law, it is cop. It is okay to do it, but then you know so some people feel it's not the right thing to do, and there's a whole sort of gap right now intellectual property around copying things. Also around safety, there's a lot of talk about guns. Um, I think that the the gun issue in 3D printing is not so much that criminals are going to use it, but it's more that uh, every teenager and their brother and sister are going to download these things and print them and you walk away for a Saturday afternoon and you come back and your child has a gun. Not that they want a gun, but it's forbidden to do it, so it's a good reason to try. And uh, kids might injure themselves and so forth. This is a topic sort of that brings me to the issue of safety also, that people use, uh, uh, as the technology progresses, people will worry about not just um, you know, printing Trotskys that they have at home, but actually printing functional parts like steering wheels and bicycle hamlets. And at that point, if it breaks, who's to blame? Whose responsibility it is to make sure the design is intact? If it uh, isn't, uh, who's, uh, who's responsible for it? And so forth. A lot of uh, implications also to the environment. N not all of them are good. I came uh, to the lab just recently to find a garbage can full of 3D printed stuff. If you have a access to a 3D printer, just go to the garbage can next to it, you'll see tons and tons of plastic. We're producing this uh, at an alarming rate. I think uh, in engineering, we always used to say, think twice, cut once. But uh, with uh, this technology, you can sort of debug. You can print lots of variations, try them out, doesn't work, print again. And this is something we'll have to think about. But on the flip side, there's a lot of positive. Supply chains are going to be compacted, distribution uh, networks are going to be shortened, uh, and things are going to be made more efficient, as I said, with profound implications to the environment. So even though people aren't, most people aren't aware of the fact that printing in plastic is 10 to 20 times more expensive in energy per kilo of printed part than injection molding, it potentially is much more efficient over its lifetime if you use it the right way. So the, for example, aircraft parts that are printed, although they're more expensive to print energetically, they save fuel over the lifetime of the aircraft uh, that is much, uh, many times over the amount of energy, the extra energy used to produce them. So that's all episode three. That is all profound things happening because of the freedom of shape. And so that freedom of shape is episode one, which is finishing sort of now. We're reaching the maturity of that. But let me tell you quickly what the last three episodes are. The next one, I don't have as much to say about it because they're in the future, but the second one is new kinds of materials. So when we switch to freedom with shape to freedom with materials. So I'm not talking about the fact that you can shove different materials into a 3D printer and different colors and print with multiple materials like this part that's printed with rubber tires and solid body. That is exciting, but that's not where the end of the story is. You can print robotic parts with hard and soft materials you can even combine materials together to make arbitrary performance in various ways. Here we have, we're combining hard and soft material. We have design automation algorithm that tells us how to combine the material automatically to obtain arbitrary deflection uh, profiles for the beam. So this is, these are things that you know, are very interesting. But that's not where it gets exciting. It will get exciting when we learn how to combine materials at the micro scale to create entirely new materials. For example, even just black ink on a white paper can create lots of shades of gray just by combining the materials in different patterns. And so similarly, you can co combine basic material in the air 
to create new kinds of material performance that you cannot find any other way. So just the pattern itself is creating these new metamaterials that were not possible before with bizarre and strange and new material properties, some of which are very difficult for us to predict. For example, this is sort of printed fur that's printed by layering material very gradually and you can sort of create uh, material with, with really strange behavior, uh, something that doesn't feel at all like plastic. This is a piece of my chainmail tie, which I forgot to bring, otherwise I would be wearing my 3D printed tie. It feels like cloth, uh, and you can print it. I've seen some of these versions at such high resolution. It really begins to feel soft and interesting. This is another experiment we did in the lab. It started off as a bug, but turned into a feature. One of our printers wasn't calibrated, well, and the material came out of the nozzle, but it was too far up, so it sort of meandered as it came down. If you've ever poured honey, you know that as it meanders, it creates this sort of semi-stochastic pattern, and we use that to sort of print foam-like material. This is sort of very interesting soft material that we can vary in its elasticity and its density. It has a lot of interesting application, all based on this sort of one material, but printed in new ways. But you can also combine materials uh, in, in, in patterns to create completely non-natural materials uh, that have performance that really depends on the pattern. So you, here we're mixing two, pa two materials 50-50 and you get very different sort of mechanical performance based on the pattern of mixing. So again, two materials 50-50, the pattern matters and you can exploit that to create new kinds of materials. For example, this is a classic example. If you pull a rubber band, it becomes thinner. Okay, you've, you've tried that. But you can print a material that when you pull on it, it becomes thicker. An oxetic material, negative Poisson ratio. You can print that. Very difficult to find that in nature, but easy to make from base material. So the key take home point here is that when you combine material in a print, you can create new materials whose material properties do not interpolate the base material. They're outside of the properties of the base material. So really, a whole new design space that is opening us up, beginning to open up with these multi-material printers that we have just begun to explore. This is another example of a self-healing material that you pull apart. Uh, it's strong, but at some point it, it sort of breaks, but then you can snap it together, and it's like, <clears throat> like it never happened before. Uh, Episode three is moving from uh, printed, uh, from passive parts to printing integrated active systems. So going back to this robot, if you remember, we printed uh, all the white part, but we had to manually put in the wires and the batteries and so forth. So one of the big questions was, can we actually print uh, the whole thing, batteries included? And uh, we, to do that, we created our open source printer that, because we couldn't stick material into the commercial printers, uh, which we could use to print all kinds of crazy things like batteries, for example. Uh, these are batteries, fully functional batteries printed <clears throat> around 90, uh, 2006. They have energy capacity similar to conventional batteries, but they are, it can be printed in any shape. We printed muscles based on multiple materials uh, and so forth. One example is uh, we really wanted to demonstrate this uh, and we printed a copy of a telegraph machine. So here's one of the uh, telegraph machines. Turns out that two of them, uh, the two of them are in existence. Obviously, one of them is Smithsonian, but the other one is in at Cornell. We found it in the dean's office in the closet somewhere. Dusted it off, catted it up, and printed a copy, including the wires and the magnets and the whole thing, and sent a message across it. And in case you're not up to snuff with your Morse code, this is the message we sent, and it came out the other side. So again, 100% printed. This is another example. Uh, this one actually was uh, appeared in a recent, uh, this is actually New York Times just this weekend in a, a Sunday review. We printed a whole meal uh, from A to Z for A.J. Jacobs uh, and his wife, including the cutlery, the silverware, the, the plates, and the pizza, and the food, and everything. And we also printed the speaker that produced uh, their uh, uh, romantic music for the dinner. So 
This is a speaker that's 100% 3D printed, including the wiring and the magnet and the membrane is 100%. And I think it's the first example of a 100% printed consumer electronic device. And this is sort of where I think things are heading. Of course, ultimately, I really want to print, this is sort of my career goal, is to print a robot that will walk out of the printer, batteries included. Just, just uh, step off. Uh, there's a long ways uh, until we get there. Meanwhile, we've, this is our robot. It's a fish. Uh, <clears throat> it has a battery. It has an actuator at the end. And I'm, I'm uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, it, I'm sorry to say that it doesn't work. It actually, uh, you know, just uh, floats uh, up there. But this is, you know, a first step. And I, you know, I'm hoping that soon we'll get our printer, to, uh, uh, robot to walk on the printer. So the last episode is the switch from analog to digital. And this is a little bit of a tricky idea, but it's this idea that instead of depositing continuous material, the printer deposits tiny, tiny building blocks. In other words, it switches from continuous materials to discrete materials. So just like you look at this circle, but it's really made out of pixels, you can imagine a world where things look analog, but they're really made of lots and lots of tiny building blocks assembled uh, into a structure. And in fact, all of biology is assembled from a f fairly small set of amino acids that, that produce all the proteins from which we are made. So the precedence exists for this. The question is, how can we assemble them together? Because we need to literally assemble billions of micro-scale uh, Lego bricks to make arbitrary three-dimensional things. So to do that, we're thinking of an idea called a rapid assembler. Uh, a sort of where I think you know 3D printers will go in maybe 20 to 30 years, which assemble objects out of lots and lots of tiny building blocks. This is an example of a 3D uh, assembled, if you like, rook. It's made of plastic and metal, and uh, it's made out of about 10,000 units, so it's a lot smaller than what you can imagine this thing will be in the future. We'll talk about gigavoxel printers, but this is sort of where it begins. But the idea is that you can assemble it from building blocks that are conductive, non-conductive, such as this nylon and copper, but also building blocks with, with sensors and actuators and so forth, all kinds of things. Eventually, it will become small. These are 500 uh, micron building blocks, and eventually becomes uh, powder that you put into your printer and assemble three-dimensional objects. So to sum things up, uh, I think it's good to think of 3D printing as something that is happening in episodes. We're at the end of episode one, where we can print, we've gained control in printing any shape and form. We now begin entering an era where we can print new kinds of materials, not shove new kinds of materials into the printer, but actually make new kinds of materials by printing. We can pr then switch to printing active materials like electronics, and from there move from analog to digital. So last word is, I'm always asked, everybody wonders, is this a fad? Or is this here to stay? Is this a real technology changer? And I want to argue that it is because it has the same, um, same hallmarks of the previous industrial revolutions. And that is that something that used to be expensive went to zero cost. First industrial revolution, power went to zero. It used to be very expensive to get power from water wheels and from animals. It, after the steam engine, it effectively went down by orders of magnitude the cost of a single watt. That had a cascade of uh, innovations, led to a cascade of innovations in industry. The second industrial revolution happened when the cost of calculation went to zero from adding a few numbers per hour by the best calculators uh, to uh, billions of numbers per second with a cascade of downstream innovation. The third example is when um, is the cost of communication uh, went down. Communicating large amounts of information across the planet is as, as easy compared to the Pony Express, where computing, sending information was slow and expensive. And with 3D printing, the cost of making complex things has gone to zero. Making something complex is the same cost as making something simple. And that is a profound change for most of human history. And so if you look at Human evolution, we like to think of humans as distinguishing themselves by creating tools, and I think 3D printing is really the ultimate tool uh, in that series, and I think that's where, why it's here to stay. Thank you.
Um, so, thank you, Hod. Actually, we're just about out of time. I know that um, the room has another reservation at two. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions. If you have questions for Hod, maybe you can um, see him out in the, the hallway afterwards. But I just want to say one word of thanks to Hod. And um, you know, I was just thinking that like a good technical paper or probably like a good uh, novel or movie, you as a, as a speaker have anticipated many of our questions. And you know, as I was jotting down my own questions, you then answered them. So hopefully, um, uh, we've all got a lot to chew on. And, I guess the last thing I want to do, especially for the architecture students, is put the question to you, um, meaning after you've seen a lot of the possibilities here from Hod, um, especially in the context of you guys uh, being at a school of architecture that's known for its technological exploration and being on the cutting edge of using new digital design tools, my question for the students is, so how do you take that and then uh, what and how are you going to design when you go three floors up to your desk? So thank you again, Hot. My pleasure. Thank you.